Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. In the early morning hours of Friday, December 8th, 2000, the streets of Dublin, Ireland were rainy, cold, and quiet. 22-year-old Trevor Dealey was making his way home after a night out with colleagues at their company Christmas party. Trevor was in a great mood and probably looking forward to a few hours of sleep before heading into his office at the Bank of Ireland. The next morning, however, Trevor's desk sat empty. Knowing it had been a late night for the normally exemplary employee, his boss gave him a pass for not showing up. It wouldn't be until he failed to show up the following Monday that people in Trevor's life would realize that something horrible had happened. Now, over two decades later, his family is still actively searching for Trevor, and a mysterious man in black may have the answers that everyone has been looking for. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Trevor Dealey. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone welcome back thank you for joining us once again this week we are taking you to dublin ireland partially because we have a podcast mystery that i need our irish listeners to help us out with Mm, okay I'm, i'm intrigued i feel like i might have mentioned this to you recently i found out that we were ranked on the irish apple podcast charts as number 19 in all podcasts what yeah and number five in true crime whoa yeah my mind is blown no i know and we definitely do not normally live there. And in fact, as we're recording this, I think we're completely like back off of the charts altogether. Ooh, yikes. <laughs> but yeah, I have no idea what happened. Like, I don't know if we were mentioned in an article somewhere that like made people listen to us. And it, it cause it was just so bizarre. So I don't know. We were briefly huge in Ireland. That is bizarre yeah so i don't know so i'm like really curious as to like what happened a few weeks ago or a week ago whenever it was to to drive that so i don't know um i think it's also maybe the universe telling me something because i after i was thinking about this i realized that last month august of 2023 marks the 20 year anniversary of the last time i was in ireland because oh. i was last there in august of 2003 interesting so i don't know if you if you want us to come back just ask just <laughs> I'll come. if any of you have like a nice place to stay um you know we'll be there so that got me thinking about ireland and we covered the case of Dieter Jacobs before right. she was part of the vanishing triangle. And right. so it made me wonder like what other unsolved missing persons cases are there in Ireland? And I came across this one of, of Trevor Dealey and it is huge. So he disappeared from Dublin and everything that I've read said that like his family really, 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 was incredibly proactive and has worked so hard for the past 20 plus years to keep his name out there, to try to get information and to make sure people don't forget his story. So I'm very excited to be sharing that today and kind of helping it, you know, get across the pond a little bit because I'll admit, like, I had never heard of this. Um, So, yeah, so we're going to bring this to our American and American listeners and everybody else as well. But before we get started, I want to give a special shout out to our newest member over on Patreon, Lynette M. Thank you so much for your support, Lynette. It really means a a lot to us. Thank you so much. 
If you would like to join us over there, you can get these episodes early and ad-free at any level, just whatever you want to do. But now let's get into the story of Trevor Dealey. Trevor Dealey was born on August 15th, 1978 to Anne and Michael Dealey in Nace County Kildare in Ireland. All right, and I'm going to make a disclaimer right off the bat. Like, I got some shit uh, online (laughs) this week for mispronouncing uh, a town name in our Claudia Lawrence episode. And it is true because like I I I have a thing where if I'm talking about like towns or names or whatever that are already in English, I just assume that I can like pronounce them. And it turns out that oftentimes I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so where Claudia Lawrence is from in the UK, I pronounced it Hayworth, but it's Worth. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and like I, I, I apologize if I think that I'm wrong. I'll look it up, but sometimes I just don't think that I'm wrong, and then I find out later that I am, and I don't mean it to be disrespectful. So somebody was very mad at me online this week, and I do apologize. I'm not like I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be better. But also, I can't do accents at all as you pointed out to me in spain Mm -hmm. um in somewhat of a hurtful way at her restaurants (laughs) because you said something we were at this restaurant right as we're leaving spain and the waiter could barely speak english and i can barely speak spanish and we're really trying to communicate and after we left you're like yeah it's so amazing how you don't even try to do an accent (laughs) well you don't (laughs) like like even, even when i try to uh speak Spanish, uh, you know, I try to get an accent in there. It's not that I don't try. I'm just really not good at it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So my point is I'm trying. I bring this up because uh, Nace, where Trevor Dealey is from, is in County Kildare in Ireland. And Nace, I believe, is the, and I'm probably going to get this backwards because I looked it up. And I think Nace is the Irish way to pronounce it. But Nas is like the non-Irish way to pronounce it. So okay. I'm just going to say Nace, and I'm, I'm just sorry. Like, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so Nace in County Kildare, Ireland. Trevor is the youngest of four children. He has an older brother, Mark, and two older sisters, Michelle and Pamela. Trevor was described by his family as easygoing, but as a teenager, he didn't really seem to have, like, a particular direction. He wasn't sporty or particular into academics like his siblings. So when he graduated high school, Trevor wasn't really sure what his next move would be. You know, he kind of followed the path that I think he thought he should follow and ended up attending the Waterford Institute of Technology where he studied business. But like after his first year, he realized that that was not for him. And then he ended up dropping out. Fortunately, his older siblings were looking out for him. His sister Michelle found him an IT certification course for him to take in Dublin. And he agreed and immediately fell in love with it. She was like, he took to it like a duck to water. Like he finally seemed to figure out like what worked for him. Trevor did so well at that course that when he completed it in May of 1999, he had three job offers. Oh, nice. Yeah, right? Like I wish I had three job offers when I graduated college. (laughs) I did not. He ended up accepting a position with Bank of Ireland Asset Management in Dublin, which was about 45 minutes away from his family's home. So give or take. Um, I don't think he had a car, but you could easily take the train. And I think his his dad actually commuted to Dublin for work. Um, I mean, 45 minutes isn't terrible. Yeah, it's better than your commute. So Yeah. yeah, so his dad commuted, but you know, Like Trevor was a young guy. He's 21 when he takes this job. So he ended up being able to get a flat in Dublin, again, thanks to his sister, Michelle. So she had a friend who I guess had an extra room and he was able to move in there. So he ended up sharing this flat within walking distance to his office. Nice. Yeah, with Michelle's friend and another woman. Trevor was well-liked at the office and was really good at his job. His manager, Dara Tracy, said of him, quote, he was a very happy guy. 
He had this big, happy face on him. He was one of these nice guys to be around. He was very positive. He never bitched about other people or gave out about them. He had a very good work ethic. He was very trustworthy. I'm not just saying this because of the situation, but Trevor was a good guy, end quote. Trevor's two closest friends throughout childhood remained close to him as they embarked upon adulthood. Glenn Cullen and Conleth Lunan described Trevor as someone who liked to go out and have some pints, but wasn't a huge party animal. While Trevor was working at the bank, Glenn was working as an international flight attendant for Aer Lingus. As you know, like working as a flight attendant comes with perks, including the ability to get discounted plane tickets for his friends and family. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very nice. In late November of 2000, Glenn ended up giving Trevor a heavily discounted ticket to Alaska. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And he said it, it probably costs like 80 euros or something like that. So, I mean. I want to go to Alaska. I know. Me too. Um, so, yeah, it was basically free. And Trevor wanted to travel there to meet up with some girls, one girl in particular, that he had met over the summer while they were visiting Dublin. Now, it seems as though Trevor had either had a thing with one of these girls or wanted to, but either way, he basically emailed them and was like, hey, I've got some time off coming up. Like, how about I come to visit? And, you know, the girl was like, well, you know, I'm really busy, like, whatever. It's not a good time because this was late November and she was in college. So Mm, I finals. Exactly. Right. So it probably legitimately was not a good time. But he was like, yeah, no, don't worry. Like, I, I just... I've got the time I want to come anyway. So he did. So Trevor went and then returned from his trip on December 5th. And even though he flew into Dublin airport, he caught, I believe, a bus and made the trip back to Nice to see his family. His parents, Anne and Michael, recalled that he was jet lagged and yawning the entire time he was there, which makes total sense. That's a very long flight. Anne cooked him dinner, and Michael, his dad, had to go off for evening meetings. So he just kind of said hi to his son and, you know, was like, hey, tell me about your trip, like, when you're in town next weekend. But Anne cooked him dinner, and then Trevor returned to Dublin so that he could go to work the next morning. Damn, really? Yeah, he didn't, I'm not saying, you know, 22, not the greatest at like planning things. He didn't build a a day in there? A day in for recovery? No, he did not. So the next day was a Wednesday and, um, and yeah, he went to work. Now, according to Michael, Trevor had initially planned on coming back down to Nice that weekend. So that is what prompted that whole like, hey, I'm on my way out to the meeting. Tell me about your Alaska trip when you come down this weekend. But Trevor apparently told his parents that night that he wasn't going to come down that weekend. But again, he lives 45 minutes away from them, so it's not like a huge deal, yeah. right? They'll see me eventually. Yeah, and Christmas is coming up. He was going to have time off. Like it just was, you know, whether he came down that weekend or not, not a big thing. But his friends say that like at some point between that conversation with his parents and like the next day, I guess, he must have changed his mind because he made plans with them to meet at Fletcher's, which is their, like, hangout in Nice, that Saturday, December 9th. Okay, so he was going back. Yeah, so it sounds like he had been planning on it, then he kind of said, no, I'm not going to come down. But then at some other point between Tuesday and Thursday, he told his friends, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll come down, let's go meet at Fletcher's on Saturday night. Okay. So anyway, so Trevor went back to Dublin that evening, that Tuesday, and went to work on Wednesday, December 6th as normal. Thursday the 7th was the office Christmas party, which was to take place at the Hilton Hotel on Charlemont's place. The whole party was going to be there, and it was dinner, drinks, and a band. Nice. Yeah. And that hotel was, like, pretty close to the office. Like, this is all, like, right in the city center of Dublin, it sounds like. So before that, you know, it sounds like after work, I think he did go home for a little bit after work, took care of a few things. He actually called his dad. I think he was having problems with like the electricity in his apartment, got it figured out, you know, just did a few things. But then before the Christmas party was to start, he met up with a few of his colleagues at Copperface Jack's, which was a nearby bar, basically to pregame. Can I just say that like, I really enjoy the names of all of these places. 
Oh, yeah, for sure. They get better. <laughs> but yeah, Copper Face Jacks. Love it. I know. So after that, they went to the actual Christmas party at the Hilton. And that went fairly late. It seems like Glenn called Trevor, although Trevor might have called Glenn, but I think it makes more sense for Glenn to have called Trevor because when he called the when he called him around eleven or eleven thirty, Trevor was still like at the party at the Hilton and it was so loud. Like he answered the phone, but they couldn't really talk uh-huh. because, you know, it's the middle of a party. So Glenn's like, hey, don't worry about it. We'll catch up later. At 12.28 a.m., CCTV at a nearby ATM shows Trevor pulling out a small amount of cash, and then he went right back into the party. And the party kept on going for a couple hours after that. After the official party ended, Trevor, along with his manager, Dara, and a few others, went to Buck Whaley's nightclub. (laughs) Love it. Yes. On Lower Leeson Street, arriving close to 2.30 a.m. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, this so, is getting wild. Yeah, that Christmas party, like, really, <laughs> it was happening. Now, Trevor stayed out at that nightclub until nearly 3.30 a.m., which is pretty late in general, but super late when you're expected to work the next morning. Right, yeah. And you're with, like, your manager. Your co-workers, yeah. your other co-workers. So that night slash morning, it was poor pouring down rain in Dublin. Not only that, there was a taxi strike. Uh. So Trevor's only option to get home was to walk. Now, luckily, he's not super far from home, and he always walked from his house to the office. So, like, he was just a dude who walked in the city a lot. So, like, that wouldn't have, you know, bothered him mm-hmm. in and of itself but except it's raining and it, very late exactly right so like that part of it's not great buck whalen's uh was only i want to say like five or so minutes away from his office so he actually decided to go there first to the office yeah at three thirty in the morning yeah it was actually about three twenty-five okay. when he arrived there Now, one of his co-workers, Carl Pender, was actually at the office working the night shift. So I guess they had to do like overnight IT stuff. Oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. And so he was there and it wasn't his usual shift, but he was like filling in for somebody or whatever. But the point is that somebody was there and he said that Trevor came in just soaked, like Mm. to the bone just completely soaked. And, you know, Carl was obviously surprised to see him because he didn't expect anybody to, like, stop in at 3.30 in the morning after the Christmas party. But, you know, he was also probably grateful for, like, a distraction from a boring overnight shift. Yeah. So Trevor asked him if he had time for a cup of tea. And Carl's like, yeah, sure. You know, I just have something I need to finish up real quick. And so Trevor's like, all right, cool. And then Trevor went to his desk and logged onto his computer and then did something really quickly as well while Carl was finishing up what he was finishing up. Then the two went to the break room and, you know, Carl had his tea and Trevor had a cup of coffee. Now, Carl says that he could tell that Trevor had been drinking, mm-hmm. but like he wasn't falling down drunk or anything like that. Mm-hmm. You know, he was together, you know, but it was clear that he had been out all night. The two chatted for a bit about the Christmas party and like who was there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, But then Carl had to get back to work. So they said their goodbyes. Trevor grabbed a promotional golf umbrella that the company had lying around in the office and left. And what what time was that that he left? So this is close to four at this point. Now, Trevor's father, Michael, said that the police checked his work computer, you know, after Uh all of this to see if there were any clues in general, of course, but then also specifically to see, like, what he was doing that evening when he was there. But according to Michael, like, they didn't find anything significant. Like, whatever it was that he was doing that night was boring, Basically, (laughs) like he wasn't emailing people, making plans or doing anything, you know, exciting. It was just like, I don't know, maybe he checked his email. Maybe he just did whatever. But it wasn't anything that piqued investigators interests in the least. So why do you think he made a stop there then to get the umbrella? Yeah. 
Oh. I honestly think that's why, because apparently they had several of these promotional umbrellas just like around. Uh-huh. And so I think that, yeah, like the office was literally on his way home. It was raining. He's like, oh, shit, I can go at least get an umbrella there and then make my way home. I think, honestly, that's all it was. And maybe, you know, he wanted to like sober up a little bit. But I mean, since he was walking, it probably really was just to go get an umbrella. Now, is this around four o'clock is this the last time anyone saw him well yeah so at 406 a.m according to phone records trevor called glenn right his friend who had mm-hmm. called him earlier now glenn was asleep and his phone was charging downstairs so he didn't hear it ring trevor left a voicemail that glenn says said something to the effect of Quote, hi, Glenn, I've missed you there, just on my way home, all going good, I'll talk to you tomorrow, end quote. Okay. Now, Glenn, I say, you know, something to the effect of, because, like, Glenn listened to the message the next morning and was like, okay, cool, and deleted it, Uh because that wasn't something he really felt he needed to save at the time. It didn't seem that important. He just assumed that he would talk to uh, Trevor later that day. But that phone call at 406 the reason we know it was 406 is because that was the last activity on trevor's cell phone Uh. a few minutes after this phone call at 4 14 a.m trevor with his promotional golf umbrella was captured on cctv at a bank of ireland building on the corner of baggett street bridge and haddington road he then walked out of the range of the camera and was never seen again The workday began just a few hours later, but there was no Trevor. Now, this was somewhat strange, but not completely unexpected. According to Dara, several people who were at the Christmas party the night before didn't come into work that day, but it was unusual for Trevor. Like, he had that 22-year-old stamina, (laughs) you know, and he had managed to make it in on time after previous late nights out with colleagues. Carl, the coworker, said that um, that he could tell he was drinking, but he wasn't like fall down drunk. Exactly, so right? He'd probably like, be tired, but not like super hungover. Yeah, not to the point we're going to miss the entire day of work. Like yeah. maybe you come in a little bit late. Yeah, but like you come in eventually. But regardless, like I said, you know there were other people who like straight up did not come in that day, so they kind of wrote it off. But then Monday rolled around and there was still no Trevor. Dara and the rest of Trevor's colleagues immediately became worried because it was so out of character for him to not come in in general. And, you know, they didn't even have the excuse of like the late night out at the club, right? So they obviously tried calling his cell phone, but there was no answer. After they couldn't reach him, you know, they were kind of talking amongst themselves and saying like, hey, have you heard from him? Like, did you see him this weekend? What's going on? But they realized that nobody in the office had seen him since the party on Thursday night. So then Dara like basically went to HR in a panic and was like, hey, what do we do? Like, we cannot find this guy. He's not in. It's really weird. And so HR went and kind of looked through his file and found his parents' number and called them. Uh. And that's basically how the dealies first found out that their son was missing. I, I should say, though, when Anne first got the call that Trevor hadn't shown up to work, she didn't realize that he was actually missing. Right. Yeah. You know, I'm sure she was concerned, but she didn't immediately jump to the worst conclusion. She called Michael at work and told him about the call, but like that was kind of it at that point. However, after, you know, a little time went by, I think she probably got more worried and was trying to call Trevor herself and couldn't get a hold of him. So she's like, oh, I don't know. This is seeming a little weird. So she called Michael back. Who remember, worked in Dublin. Right. I was like, yeah. hey, can you go, go buy his? Him. Yeah, go yeah. buy his apartment and go check on him. And so I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And he did. And I don't know exactly when. He probably honestly waited until he was off of work. Yeah, because I'm sure he didn't think anything of it. Yeah. Either way, he went by and... 
he was probably just expecting to find that his son was like sick or, you mm-hmm. know, something like that, right? So he went to the flat and rang the doorbell, but nobody answered. Now, Michael didn't have a key to his son's apartment or anything like that, so he couldn't go in. But it was then that he was like, okay, something's not right. Now, I'm pulling a lot of my research on this, um, on kind of the timeline leading up to the investigation from a fantastic three-part article written by Rosita Boland for the Irish Times in 2015. Michael told Boland that once he realized his son wasn't at home, quote, my head began to buzz eventually when it began to dawn on me. Could he be missing? I was getting more and more concerned thinking, is this going to be our situation? Is Trevor a missing person now? End quote. And so this is when everyone started to drop everything to look for Trevor. Trevor's brother, Mark, lived with his pregnant wife on the other side of the country in Castlebar. After his mother called him and told him what was going on with Trevor, he canceled his appointments and drove to his parents' house in Nace with the plan to help search for his missing brother. As he made the drive, Michael and Anne were contacting more people, including Glenn and other friends, in hopes that, you know, somebody would know something about Trevor's whereabouts. No one did, though. So as Mark made his way from Nace to Dublin to begin the physical search, Michael went to the Garda station to report his son missing. What time was this? Evening. On Monday. Yes, on Monday. Okay. As Mark began his search, he knew part of his brother's timeline on Thursday night just from like talking to people. Like he had found out about the party, and you know, I'm sure Glenn had said, like, yeah, he had called me, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he knew like some of what was going on, but not the full thing. So he started at Copper Jack's, which was the first bar that Trevor had visited that evening, in hopes that maybe he had returned after he had stopped by the office. No one had seen him there, though. So after that, Mark basically followed the route back to Trevor's apartment with part of him expecting to find his brother lying in an alley or a ditch somewhere. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing was Mark eventually made his way to the U.S. Embassy and spoke with a security guard. He told Mark that President Bill Clinton was arriving in Dublin the next day. So all trash cans and dumpsters in the area had been emptied. Oh, wow. Yeah, right? Like, what a weird coincidence. As part of the security process, you know, in advance of this appearance by the U.S. president, all of the manholes had also been checked and secured. Uh So this meant that not only was Mark not going to be able to like physically find his brother. I mean, because if his brother had been lying in an alley or whatever somewhere, like he would not be there currently. Yeah. But any potential items dropped or clues or anything that had been thrown in the trash or in a dumpster would be gone as well. That's crazy. Just the outside factors that contributed to this case. Like, first, you've got the taxi strike. Yeah. Which we'll talk more about. Like, to walk home. Yeah. And then it had other implications as well. But, you know, that was the main one, right? And then freaking President Clinton coming the next day, meaning that they like cleaned up everything in the area. So, you know, potentially just accidentally taking any possible clues or evidence. Yeah, Yeah. Just. Unbelievable. So that same evening, Monday evening, Trevor's sister Michelle also found out about her missing brother. She was living in London at the time, so she flew out the next morning to help with the search. Their other sister Pamela also came home, and they, along with Michael, his colleagues, and friends of the family and Trevor, all began to search Dublin. And what are the Garda doing at this point? So they're like starting their investigation. I mean, they were, it seems like taking it seriously, but it seems that the family was just much more proactive. Uh. So the family was really like boots on the ground immediately. And it took the Garda a little bit of time to kind of catch up. Yeah. I mean, they might've also been a little busy with, Again, with the president coming in, right? right. And so like, that's the other thing that we have. 
So the whole family, except for Anne, who stayed home and kind of manned the phones, went to Dublin and handed out hundreds of flyers. They hung up laminated missing posters, and they went door to door to homes, pubs, restaurants, like basically talking to as many people as humanly possible in hopes that somebody had seen Trevor or knew something about what had happened to him. Trevor's good friend, who I mentioned earlier, Conleth Lunen, worked for a company that supplied CCTV equipment. So he immediately recognized how important it was to speak to nearby businesses and get whatever footage they may have had. Uh He knew that at that time, footage was stored on VHS tapes that were either kept for a short period of time or in a lot of cases recorded over every 24 hours. Right. And, you know, keep in mind, they're like four days behind, basically, Mm -hmm. on the search in general, right? So anything that could have potentially had Trevor captured that was erased after 24 hours, like, that's gone, Mm -hmm. right? So their only hope at this point is, like, businesses who kept footage for a week or whatever. And that truly was not a lot of them. And on top of that, in 2000, there were just fewer cameras in general than there are today. So it was really a tough situation and they were racing against time. So he and other friends were actually the ones responsible for securing the CCTV footage from that bank that I mentioned earlier. And when they got there, basically the manager is like, oh, yeah, I'm glad you came because we were about to record over this. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they wouldn't release the footage to them, but they're like, we'll hold the tape. Yeah. And so if the police come and ask for it, like, we'll give it to them. And so thankfully they did. And the police did come eventually. (laughs) But yeah, they like the police would not have gotten there in time from what it sounds like. I guess I'm having a little bit of an issue with the timeline. Okay. So you said that he lived like five minutes from his office? No, about 15, I think. Is it 15? Yeah. So the office was about like five minutes or so from the last club he was at. Okay. Is the bank where he was last seen on CCTV footage close to his apartment? Yes. It was on the way home from his office to his apartment. Because you said he left the office around four and he was seen at 414. Right. And, and I did read something that said that like he actually should have made that walk a bit quicker. Yeah. But he had been drinking. Apparently like he was a smoker. And so like maybe he like kind of stopped to light a cigarette or, you know, whatever. But yeah, I mean, it did actually take him a little bit longer from what it sounds like to get to that location than it necessarily should have i mean he's pretty close to his house then yeah what about the roommates did they did the police interview them did they say anything about like seeing him that night or when the last time was no. they saw him no i didn't i never read anything specific about the roommates being interviewed i am 100 percent positive that they were simply because Remember that girl in in Alaska that he visited in yeah. late November? Yeah. So eventually, at some point, the police actually went to Alaska to interview her. But not only that, Trevor's sisters flew out to Alaska to talk to her. So if they're going to go to that extent, then one would assume that they interviewed the yeah. roommates. Yeah. yeah. And especially because Michelle was friends with one of the oh, roommates. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. A hundred and twenty percent they talked to the roommates. Okay. So I don't know what the roommate said, but whatever it was, like wasn't material uh, to yeah, the investigation. It's probably no, we didn't see him that yeah, night. Yeah, or like we were out, we were gone, we were yeah. asleep, whatever. And again, Trevor seemingly did have plans to go back to Nice that weekend, so it wouldn't have even been weird that the roommates didn't see him at all that weekend. Right. Because it sounds like he went back to Nace a lot and, you know, they were his roommates, like not his parents. They didn't (laughs) track all of his activities. So on Tuesday, December 12th, the day after Trevor was reported missing, authorities brought in divers to search the Grand Canal between Lesson Street Bridge and Bagot Street Bridge. As awful as the thought was, the Dealies knew that the most likely place for something to have happened to Trevor was right there. They watched the divers, bracing for the worst, but nothing was turned up. 
Hmm. Then, you know, when they got the CCTV footage from the bank, that showed that Trevor had made it across the bridge safely. So the bank was on the other side of the bridge. Gotcha. Yeah. So they knew that nothing, like nothing happened to him as he was crossing that bridge between his office and that bank. Though both investigators in the Dealey family are confident that neither Trevor nor any of his belongings ended up in the canal, they are not as confident that there isn't something that hasn't been found in the canal basin. Now, this area is much deeper and more difficult to search. It also can't be drained because draining it would affect the structural integrity of the surrounding buildings. Oh, wow. So Trevor's family hasn't ruled out that either Trevor or some of the items he had with him that night could be in the basin, but they don't believe, again, that he went in like that night. Mm. And that kind of gets us to two of the most popular theories on the case that have been kind of thrown out over the years. And those are that Trevor either accidentally fell into the water or that he decided to take his own life. Now, the dealies reject both of these for a few reasons. One, Trevor had no known thoughts of suicide, nor was he suffering from depression or displaying any signs of wanting to take his own life at any time, including minutes prior to his disappearance. Two, Trevor wasn't stumbling drunk or anything like that. By all accounts, he had his wits about him, so it seems unlikely that he would accidentally fall into the water. Mm -hmm. Plus, Michelle says that she had just happened to call him a few times over the weekend, and she is almost certain that the phone rang as opposed to going straight to voicemail. Right. Now, the way his particular Nokia worked, and this is according to, you know, cell phone experts, If it had gone into the water, it would have immediately stopped working and it wouldn't have rung at all after that. And, you know, like I said, according to Michelle, like the next day it was ringing. It should also be noted that nothing belonging to Trevor ever turned up anywhere, much less in the water. His coat, shoes, phone, wallet, umbrella, nothing. The dealies kept up the search, but gained little information. They strongly believe that someone out there knows something, but it also makes sense that not a lot of people would have seen Trevor. Yeah, it's four in the morning. Exactly. And as police brought up, they didn't have their normal source of information that they would go to in a case like this. The taxi drivers. Right. Because the taxi drivers are out. They're sober. Yeah. And they notice things. They notice people. And so when something like this happens, the taxi drivers are like the first group of people that the police try to talk to. And they didn't have them. As it would turn out, however, there was at least one other person who seemingly knew something. Now we're skipping ahead to December of 2016. The case went cold in 2000. It went cold for 16 years. But in December 2016, Gardy began a cold case review of Trevor's disappearance. This involved re-examining evidence and re-interviewing witnesses. As part of re-examining evidence, investigators went to basically the only hard evidence that they had... Which was the CCTV footage. Exactly. Fortunately, technology had advanced in the intervening years, and they were able to clean up and enhance the old VHS footage. And this opened up a whole new line of inquiry. According to the enhanced footage, which was released to the public in April of 2017, and you can see it on our blog, as Trevor arrives at his office, there's a man waiting there outside. Oh, interesting. Yes. This man who is dressed in black had actually, as they reviewed more of the tape, 
been standing outside of the building for a half an hour before Trevor arrived. Hmm. Trevor and the man spoke briefly, and then Trevor went inside. Carl, you know, like Trevor didn't mention any of this to Carl. So Trevor didn't say like, hey, I ran into like so-and-so outside. Or, hey, I saw this creepy guy outside and he said something weird to me. Like, he didn't mention this encounter at all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, whatever that means, who knows? Now, according to the footage, the man stays for a little bit longer and then crosses the road after Trevor goes in. Out of camera shot. Right. After Trevor leaves the office around 4 a.m., he is seen once again on that same CCTV camera. But what is also seen is the same man from before following Trevor. Now, despite many public pleas over the years from both police and the dealies, no one has ever come forward to say that they spoke with Trevor outside of his office that night. And it is important to mention that this kind of gets left out of a lot of stories, but there were actually two other people who were kind of seen in the footage as well. Okay. And they did come forward. Oh. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, that was us. Like, and they were his coworkers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, yeah, apparently at there were three people in the footage, you know, kind of at different times. And two of them did come forward and be like, yeah, no, that was us. Everything was fine. We were just going home or whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, But this man in black has never come forward. So even though this guy was waiting around for a half hour, it couldn't have been waiting for Trevor. Right. Because like like, nobody knew that Trevor was going to go to his office. Right. So it's a completely unpredictable movement. Right. So then it's just a crime of opportunity. Maybe. But, like, also, why was that dude standing out in the rain for half an hour at 4 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, you know? Yeah. And then, like, what what did he say to Trevor? And then why did he cross the street, like, right after Trevor went in? Right. It's, yeah, it's so strange. And apparently, that man was actually seen on the next CCTV at the bank 14 or 19 seconds after Trevor passes by. Hmm. So, like, he was definitely following him. Right. But at this point, it's 2016, so there's no way to go back to find additional footage. 2017, yeah. But yeah. So, wow. So, four months later, in August 2017, a new search was announced in Trevor's case. Gardy said that they were looking into whether a known criminal was involved in Trevor's disappearance. The suspect was part of a gang that ran drugs and prostitution operations around the Baggett Street area where Trevor was last seen. The police didn't believe that the two had a previous relationship, but did believe that he could possibly be the man in black seen in the CCTV footage. A three-acre site in Chapalazad in South Dublin was cordoned off and searched over multiple days, and investigators confirmed that they were searching for a body. After six weeks of searching, police uncovered a gun and over 80,000 euros worth of drugs. Jesus. Yeah, but no sign of Trevor. Investigators later said that they didn't believe the gun was connected to his case and that the land was a commonly used stash area for criminals. Well, clearly. Yeah, I mean, $80,000 or euros worth of drugs, yeah. December 2020 marked the 20th anniversary of Trevor's disappearance. In an article in the Sunday World marking the event, it's revealed that the 2017 search was a result of a tip that said Trevor had a chance run-in with this unnamed criminal and that the run-in resulted in Trevor being shot dead. However, no further evidence supporting this tip has seemingly been developed. New posters with a 100,000 euro reward were put up in Irish prisons as part of a new push for information called the Where is Trevor campaign. So nothing makes sense in this case, basically. It doesn't seem as though Trevor was wrapped up in anything weird, drugs or right. crime or anything, right, yeah. where he would have put himself at risk. Uh-huh. He was just a normal 22-year-old working like a boring office job. And again, at a bank, 
quote unquote, but it was like the bank's asset management division. It wasn't even, you know, they didn't have like a vault full of money in there. Yeah. It was just a bunch of computers. Mm -hmm. So he didn't seem to be in a high risk group. And a lot of people had said, well, you know, it was kind of a dodgy area where he was walking, which, okay, at the time, I'm sure. And, you know, one of the theories that I've seen online is like, well, maybe he said something wrong to like the man in black or somebody else and ended up getting killed for it. But like, it seems, I mean, that's pretty, like, what the hell could he have said to set that guy off to kill him? And Again, you know, Carl saw him right after whatever this interaction was. And it's not like Trevor was coming in all belligerent and, you know, acting crazy or anything. Yeah. And he didn't mention anything to Carl about it. Exactly. And so that doesn't make sense. And then, you know, another theory was like maybe... It was a mugging gone wrong or something like that. But, you know, but then, there's, I, then there's no evidence. Right. No evidence. I mean, you know, it's not like he had any money or anything valuable on him. And you don't look at this dude and think like, oh, yeah, that's a good target. Like, I'm going to get a bunch of cash out of this 22 year old, you know, like he wasn't wearing expensive like watches or anything like that. Also, if it's a crime of opportunity like that, like if it's a mugging, if it's wrong place, wrong time. He got into the middle of something he shouldn't have gotten into the middle of. Like you don't take the body with you. Right. And hide it. Yeah, you just leave it. You just leave it because if there's truly no connection between you and the victim, there's nothing to tie you to it. So as long as you get out of the area, like you're good. Right. Right? Like if it was just some random stranger and something happened, you leave. You don't risk taking a body with you. Or even if he wasn't dead at the time, like you don't risk kidnapping somebody. Uh, right. Who's six foot one, by the way. Oh, not small. Right. I mean, he was skinny, like he sure. wasn't, you know, whatever, but like still. Yeah. Like you don't be like, you don't just kidnap some six foot one, 22 year old office kid who you know is going to be missed. Like this is obviously, like if you're a criminal, you see this like, 22 year old white white guy coming toward you like you know he has a family he has friends he has co-workers this isn't somebody that you can just make disappear and nobody's gonna realize and nobody's gonna come looking for him so like none of that makes sense i mean there is the the thought that he skipped down and started as a started a new life i know i know there is But again, you know, there's no evidence leading toward that, right? Like there are no weird financial things. There's never been any potential sight of them. There was never anything kind of like hinting that that might be something that he would do. Um, You know, even with Robert Hoagie Hoagland, he had skipped out on his family Uh 20 years prior. Uh That was at least some indication. But Trevor didn't have any indication like that. There was no indication that he would ever decide to do anything like that. You know, the other thing that I've seen is that potentially, you know, it was a rainy night. It was four in the morning. You got to think that Maybe potentially he got hit by a car. Exactly. Right. But it's the same. Th- it's the same thing. Like what? Then what? Yeah, then what, right? Like you're going to be drunk enough to hit somebody with your car, but have the wherewithal to like pick up this six foot one person, take them with you, dispose of their body somewhere, right? And not say anything for 22 years. Yeah, it seems unlikely. Right? Yeah. So, like, but that's the thing. Nothing seems likely. I mean, it does seem that. This person who was following him either had something to do with it or knows something or whatever, but it's just... It doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense. December 8th, 2022 marked 22 years since Trevor Dealey was last seen, meaning that he has officially been missing for as long as he had been alive before that day. 
The dealies accept that Trevor is likely dead, but they refuse to believe any possibility without hard evidence. They also are holding on to the chance that maybe he did walk away, like maybe he did do this voluntarily. They don't think that he did, but again, they have no proof that he didn't. Though Anne and Michael have filled their lives with the love of their other three children and their now nine grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. The pain of losing their youngest son is a bottomless hole that will never be filled. Nearly 23 years later, the Dealey family is still working to keep Trevor's name in the public's consciousness. They are still appealing for anyone who may know anything, even if it doesn't seem important, to come forward. As Michelle put it back in December 2022, quote, My parents aren't getting any younger, and they need to know where he is. It's very difficult. I mean, the whole mystery surrounding his disappearance and you're wondering about this and wondering about that. And you just can never get away from it, no matter whether I drive down the country or walk out the town of Nace. It's the same thing. There's always something to remind you of Trevor. I would ask anybody with information about Trevor, about his whereabouts, to please let us know. But the appeal is to just find my son. I want him back. Dealey has been missing from Dublin, Ireland since December 8, 2000. Trevor is a white man with short, reddish-brown hair and a fair complexion. He was around 6 foot 1 with a slim build. He was last seen wearing a mustard and brown checked shirt, beige slash gray corduroy flared trousers, dark deck shoes with white stripes, a green padded jacket, and he was carrying a large dark blue umbrella with white ACC bank lettering. Anyone with information on the disappearance of Trevor Dealey is asked to contact Pierce Street Garda Station at 01-666-9000 or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-250-025. There is a 100,000 euro reward in this case. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it! <laughs>